Today on the Cameron Journal podcast, I am coming to you freshly showered and bare faced and no makeup because just all my skincare. But we are meeting with uh, Ben Landis, who I found on Twitter. Um, he follows the Cameron Journal and me personally, of course. And I wanted to engage with him because he does, and I'm quoting now, pioneering scientific research into intelligent life in alternate realities via DMT. Now, why on earth are we talking about this when this is so far out of what we usually talk about on this show? Well, longtime listeners will know that I like to take us on journeys sometimes. Yes, we do politics and the news and culture and blah, blah, blah. But given the prevalence of psychedelics in our society today and their potentiality to solve problems and potentially cure disease and all this type of thing, um, I thought it might be interesting to go open this little manhole and see what's down here so welcome ben to the cameron journal podcast hi hello thank you for having me on thank you for coming i appreciate it so um i think it's very apropos that at least here on the east coast we're having this conversation at 20 after 10 at night um and so um it's the perfect hour i think for these types of conversations um it reminds me so many times um in college or or elsewhere um when it always these conversations always seem to happen um in the in the late night hours so um i wish i were smoking as much as you but i'm the host so i have to keep a clear head but um why don't you tell us um a little bit about yourself and how you got into this sort of um research sure okay so i'm ben landis and uh, I have an education in music, a degree from Berklee College of Music, and I have a history in tech. I ran a startup called Fanbase for six years. And the way that I got into this research is uh, several years ago, a friend of mine at a party said that when she uses DMT, that then that sometimes she does, that she talks to aliens regularly. And I was mystified by this, and she's, but she said it so matter-of-factly that I thought there might be something to this. So I made a bookmark in my head at some point, I'd like to try DMT and maybe go do some experiments and see what I find. So about six months ago, uh, I was preparing for a trip to Joshua Tree where we were going to look for documentary evidence of aliens and UFOs. And we got DMT as one of the things to do on this trip. And I ended up using it early and I went looking experimenting, uh, looking for a form of life unknown to science at the time. I've heard, like I've read online, like on Reddit and stuff that um, lots of people have experience with what they call entities, you know, live, things that they think are living, um, but that there's quite a variety uh, alleged of these kinds of entities, these living things. But I just went looking for something, anything that seemed to be outside the bounds of what our scientific establishment currently accepts as true. Because I thought that if such a thing exists, then if we can find it and prove it, then wouldn't that be doing something really good for humanity? Wouldn't, well, potentially really good for humanity. Wouldn't it be something really significant that would be pushing toward truth? And so at the end of a night of experiments that did not work, I did an experiment that did work. And I had an encounter with beings that I uh, understood to be alive. And they came in down and they interacted with me. And, um, and it was mind blowing. And so I then went looking for intelligent life that can have a conversation with me. And it opened up this whole realm to me because I met um, someone who ended up uh, being a professional gatekeeper. Like that is, uh, has been his job, uh, as I understand it. And he judged me as fit to go and explore their reality. And I did. And that led to everything that has happened since. I now have applied for a job and gotten the job with these people, like with the gatekeeper. Um, I think I'm on his team now. Uh, yes, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. So much to unpack. <laughs> oh, there used to be a, this moment reminds me of a, an old radio show I used to listen to forever ago called Coast to Coast AM. And on the AM dial, they were the the place where these types of conversations um, occurred, and it's they went on the air at about eleven o'clock midnight in most time zones. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one night I had such a good 
they had such a good guest on that me and a guy who ran a 7-Eleven sat there and listened to it for two hours in a 7-Eleven one night. Um, cool. I even had uh, MOOF on the UFO tracking society. I actually used to see a therapist whose office was in the same building as them. She was actually right downstairs. Um, and so I've always kind of kept this, um, this attitude of being very, uh, Mm, oh, kind of open open to the idea with maybe a little bit of skepticism um mm -hmm. only because um as someone who's practiced transcendental meditation and has spent years and years in spiritual practice trying to fix myself only to find out i was autistic so i kind of gave up on all that um and all this type of thing i i've seen enough odd things that I can't explain that I'm open to the idea that such things exist. Cause there's a few, yeah. few too many coincidences sometimes that are kind of like, well, I can't rationally explain that. So we're going to have to file that under the, uh, the, you know, interesting, interesting things sort of, uh, sort of file. Yeah. Like there um, might be something more, maybe the explanations that we have don't cover everything kind of thing. Yes, yes. And so, um, and, and as someone who has, you know, reached those things in, in a state of sobriety on retreat where I've been eating, you know, vegetables and bone broth and water for three days, um, I have a reasonable amount of, uh, of trust that, um, that, that those, those things and experiences were, were real. Um, but I've also been a bit of a psychonaut in terms of, uh, my close friends now. I've done pretty much all the drugs there are to do, except ironically DMT, because I've, I'm always trying to find it and I'm always have just missed it, sort of just missed the person who had sort of thing. So it, it must not be for me because it hasn't come around yet. Um, uh, okay. So are you sure about if, that? Well, I figure if it is for me, it'll come to me. It's one of those things in life. If it is for you, what will I'm a firm believer in the following phrase, what is for you will not pass you by. If the if it is for me, it'll come find me. Um, but I wanted to have this conversation because I think um people who do this type of experimentation are are very interesting. So I guess the first thing um to get into now that I've monologued boringly at you, um, we'll get back to the questions. Um, I guess the first question to ask is, um, do you feel that any of this has really changed your life and your perspective? And if so, how? Oh, yeah. I mean, I have a job now working for the administration of heaven, but also heaven is a thing. Uh, that blows my mind. Like, uh, I was non-religious six months ago when I started this, and I found when I visited this other reality that, um, like, these things are science that they're just simply true and at some point truth has to be a defense i know it sounds wild but like i'm like uh i have the character of someone who isn't really religious but like if these things are fact then they're fact and uh has it changed my life yes um i have a job now doing something that i absolutely love this is my i want to be a public servant and um I have a great opportunity now to try to do something that is going to be really good for our society. Um, the job that I have is, so, um, should I, should I explain a bit about like what the journey has been like, like what led me here? I, yes, please start from the beginning. <laughs> okay. Yes. So I visited this other reality and it turns out that it is the home of Abrahamic heaven, that heaven exists and that there is an afterlife and that when we die, like there is such a thing as a soul. And that um, good news for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Uh, yes, uh, and for not a lot so of other good people, news for the rest of us. But that's okay. Not, no, 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 <laughs> not exactly. It turns out that Eastern religions are, in a sense, true as well. That if you um, if you die and it is your desire to be reincarnated, and if I I think that um, if you believe in this, sorry, I'm kind of consulting with like one of my overseers right now who could send me signals. Uh, back and forth um it tell me if i'm explaining this right that basically if you are if you believe in reincarnation and or if it's what you want to happen and or if it will be a good thing to happen if enough of those are true in a way that means it is the best outcome that you'd be reincarnated then that is a potential thing that can happen did i get that right yes i did get that right um but resurrection ironically the the spiritual practice i engaged in for most of my 20s 
kind of believes the same thing. We believe you have to cross a desert and go over a bridge first, but who cares? That's just details. But, <laughs> um, yes, well, there, uh, there's a river of forgetting. You drink from it on the way in. You cross over the bridge when you go out. It's a whole thing. Another conversation for another day. Um, but, um, yes, that that makes sense. You know, if that is, you know, you kind of manifest your own afterlife sort of thing. No, not exactly. No, it's it's more like that there are, um, huh, it's funny, actually, I have to kind of piece together the idea of thinking about it. Isn't it, sorry, I'm thinking about asking my overseer again. Um, isn't it true that basically it's like the afterlife, it's not that it's whatever you want it to be. It's that there are a bunch of possibilities and that God has decided like, this would be for the best. And so you're kind of routed into one of those possibilities if it would be for the best. Is that correct? She says yes. Oh, good. Well, that, I mean, people of the religions of the world, good news. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's, I mean, that's an interesting idea. So then I guess, how did, how have you become involved in all of this? I guess is the best uh, question. So I visited the other reality. And um, by the way, there are a bunch of realities, but I think that I've only had, ma mainly had interact, like with this one here that we're living in, and with the one that is the home of Abrahamic heaven. I think I might have had some brief interactions with it, one of the other realities, um, but I'm not totally sure about that. There seem to be things that I've, in I've encountered Jinn, like, you know, like genie type, like uh, mischievous spirits and stuff, um, including yeah, when I was- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, Oh, is it pronounced D, Dijin? Yes, that's that's one of the pronunciations because it comes from oh, okay. Aramaic. It's a whole thing. Sure, I, I haven't known. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, and I think that some of that, like, I think there might be some crossover. Like, maybe they, I don't know exactly if they go and visit or, like, get hired or stuff, but I've had some encounters with what seem to be more, like, Eastern religion, religious-inspired ideas. But uh, mainly my interactions have been with this uh, uh, reality that is the home of Abrahamic heaven. And uh, hmm. a day or two into experimenting with this stuff, I was attacked by Abrahamic demons. And I then was met by a uh, team of people, who, which is now the team that I'm working for. Um, and they came and they did therapy with me for a matter of days to help me with this demon infestation that I was facing. And while they were here helping me with my therapy, by the way, it included a bunch of um, uh, non-corporeal uh, people. Um, I've learned recently that like using the word entity and like being is, is kind of othering to them. So we want to talk about people, not about like entities, but non-corporeal, most, in fact, they're not even entirely non-corporeal. They're just m much less corporeal than we are as human, as humans. Um, and uh, let's see. So there were a bunch of non-corporeal people. There was also a gigantic praying mantis that was there who was seven feet tall. Uh, and, um, and I love this team so much. Oh, and there were also there was a dead human named David who demonstrated a technique called banishing. Where it, basically, it's where you call on the power of God and fire a blast of it at something malevolent that uh, gets rid of it. And so they taught, they trained me how to defend myself against these things and how to have some sort of offensive capability. They put me through therapy to help me with this stuff. And while they were here, I begged them, please, please, please tell me about how your reality works. Um, and I got them to explain some rules about how their reality works, like what the differences are, um, and about how reality works, just things that, including stuff that applies to our own reality here. New, new scientific information. Oh, I see. Yes, that's, um, I, I'm, I'm kind of familiar with uh, some of that. One of the people I followed along for a long time was named uh, David Spangler. And he writes for uh, this this organization called Lorian, and he's written about his explorations of other realms and this sort of thing. It's all very, all very fascinating. And um, yeah, I, it doesn't yeah. require DMT, by the way. Um, other drugs can help you get in touch. Uh, one, you know, in, in various ways with these other realms, with these other beings. And in fact, belief, strong belief, is a uh, good proxy in some cases, or a good substitute in some cases for what DMT can do for you. But if you're coming from a non-religious perspective, like I have been, DMT is awfully handy. My understanding though, is that uh, Jesus Christ apparently did live, apparently is the son of God, 
but never used DMT or similar substances. Is that right? Hold on, I'm asking my overseer. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Very, very interesting. Very interesting. Um, so, <laughs> so I guess then, I guess the next kind of question is though, so what has, so you've been doing this for six months. Um, how has this all affected your day to day life down here in the, in the boring material plane of existence? Oh, well, since a couple days after I started, maybe two or three days after I started, I have not been allowed to visit the reality because it's like I, I voiced my interest in getting a job with them, and I told them I have this science project. In fact, let me describe the project for you. So it's a two-part project. The first part of the project, I called it a mission at that point. I think we might be getting back into it. I started to wonder whether mission was pretentious, but I think that my overseer, my current overseer, likes the word mission more than project. Isn't that right? Yes, that is right. Um, so... Uh, the first part is to obtain scientific evidence that there exists at least one reality apart from our own that we are currently familiar with, and that it is teeming with intelligent life. And to uh, get scientific evidence that will convince our science establishment that this stuff is real and get them to take it seriously. Then part two of the project is to mobilize an effort to make friends with them and seek their help improving our world. And so we are barreling toward the completion of the first part of the project, which is what I've been hired for, and then we'll be continuing with part two. So the, the um, we found out in, uh, it was late April, oh yeah, it was like around like April 17th or something that I got the job that, I, I had been getting assessed for the job, and we found out around that time that I got the job. And with the task that we have now is, uh, they have been educating me in how to perform human resurrections and so um, we are going to be resurrecting a uh, three-year-old who and her baby brother who died in a car crash in Tennessee um, some weeks ago, I believe. And this will be, you know, if we have a successful human resurrection, then this will be enormous news and it will seem to prove a bunch of things immediately. And of course, some people like the Alex Jones types will say that they were never dead in the first place, you know they'll claim that it's fake. So we'll just do it again with, um, I think probably coming up overseer. Can you tell me, is that the time where that we're going to do one of the famous people? She says, yes. So we have a list of famous people. Um, should I show them the resurrection documents? Yes. One second. Fetching the documents. <clears throat> so like we what we have here is uh robert the realms came with paperwork oh <laughs> <laughs> yes um robert f kennedy resurrection john lennon resurrection uh kobe bryant gianna bryant and uh sorry uh freddie mercury resurrection let's uh freddie mercury has been a major focus here so maybe we can I'd like out. to put in a word for Whitney Houston. We could do one more concert before all the vocal trinity is gone. And um, Celine's not looking great right now. So if they could get on that, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> hold on. I appreciate the suggestion and I also appreciate the humor. And by the way, I have a twisted sense of humor. So uh, much appreciated. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'm not going to write down Celine, but uh, Whitney Houston, yes. Uh, well, no point in writing down Celine. She's not dead yet. She just has stiff, stiff, stiff person syndrome. So, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, you mean she's actually ill? Yeah, she has stiff person syndrome, which unfortunately it causes your uh, muscles to tense and not release, and it affects her. It has affected sometimes her voice. So what she does now every day is she exercises, does ballet, works with the trainer, and vocalizes to keep everything loose. And mm -hmm. so it's been it's been a lot. So she has a new documentary coming out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is something that, um, so I've been getting trained in how to do resurrections, but also in how to manifest miracles, like of the kind from Abrahamic theology. And, um, and by the way, I want to emphasize that this stuff that I've been learning is not a thing, like I'm not special at all. Like uh, other people can be educated in how to do this stuff. 
I simply approach them with the science project. So we hope to get millions of people trained in how to do resurrections and also how to manifest miracles. And I'm just thinking, since you brought it up, uh, there are health problems that miracles can help with. And uh, so we definitely want to look at helping people who are still alive as well. Oh, but yes, let me show you a Frederick Mercury resurrection document. Um, Sorry, it just it, is the text the correct way when you're looking at it. It is okay. Yes. So the uh, this this is essentially the plan part of the uh, of the process where I created basically a metaphorical room that I colloquially call a DMT room. I imagine it has another name that was like the actual name for it, but um, I created a metaphorical room and I put the event of Freddie Mercury's death and his, um, his illness, his uh, bronchial pneumonia resulting from AIDS into the room. And then by manifesting a miracle that deleted the room, um, we were able to delete his death and the uh, precipitating illness um, from attachment to his soul, which would that, that would uh, make, um, if he were able to be resurrected, that is a, uh, that would allow him to be resurrected. And we've already confirmed that in fact, Freddie Mercury can be resurrected. Like it will be allowed. Um, and so he's in our uh, list to do. Um, I have, I was inquiring like right after the three-year-old and, and the baby, are we going to resurrect Freddie Mercury? And I got an answer that said, perhaps they might not be the first ones, but I'm not totally sure. Um, but uh, anyway, so, so, um, let me show you next. We have notes to help with the uh, resurrection process. Uh, specifications about like height, weight, chest, waist, you know, waist to hip ratio, things like that. Um, we also have uh, resurrection add-ons. And it is very funny how much um, the way that life works, like the way that the universe is put together, it shares a lot with object-oriented programming, like coding on a computer, which is not, no, it is not, evidence that we're living in a simulation, but it, I think it might be a suggestion either that such things kind of um, uh, are naturally good ideas, that they kind of make sense logically, or that um, perhaps even that God at some point decided, like, let's make some changes and make the world work in slightly different ways. Or perhaps that as we've grown, that these things were added to our way of interacting with the universe as it is. But resurrection add-ons, um, when we're creating someone's new body, oh, by the way, that's how it works. Uh, we're not raising their dead body out of a grave or anything. We are manifesting a new body for them out of their soul. So the, uh, the process of resurrecting someone, um, the first thing that we do after deleting their death and their illness from attachment to their, or, or any precipitating injury as well, you know, that, if that's what killed them, after deleting that from attachment to their soul, then we do something that is called reality editing, and we edit their soul into being in the room with us, and then we shape their soul into their new body, and then once their body is in approximately the shape that it should be in, then we're able to manifest miracles to apply changes systematically to their, to their new body. Um, and uh, get it into the shape that we want, and then we would manifest a miracle to essentially turn on the new body, at which point they will begin living again in their new body. And yes, I do believe that this is a violation of conservation of mass, and that's just how it is. It's pretty funny that, like, yeah, it looks like a, we're going to have to revise some stuff about science, and I know it sounds very wild, but I assert that it is true, and we will be finding out very soon. Um, well, I, Einstein so, did did tell us that once you get past the speed of light, physics gets real interesting, and a lot of the rules don't apply anymore. And we also know, you know, there's really interesting stuff being done in non-Euclidean stuff and all that sort of thing. So I'm sure as time goes on, we will find all sorts of things may not be quite as we thought they were. Yes, uh, uh, yes, I agree with that. And um, sorry, let me grab my vape. Uh, I want to assert. Um, hmm. Yes, it does appear that there are things that um, there are layers and aspects to to physics and our understanding of, of the universe and reality that 
like we did not dig to the deepest level. Not that I think that we thought that, but um, there are some things that I have been learning that are just kind of common science knowledge known to the, to the people who live in this other reality. And there are things that we're going to be very soon bringing to our own understanding of science. Um, I don't think that there are that many things that are going to be overruled, except for things where it's kind of like we haven't proven them or proven them yet. Like, I don't think that we're going to find out that like, oh, it turns out the speed of light, you know, is like 300 miles an hour or something. No, no. But it's more like there are parts, there are things that we had not discovered yet and that we will get to discover real soon thanks to our friends. And, and by the way, also some of these things are, are things that um, we probably would have eventually found anyway, even without the help. Yes, of course. I, just taking a break for a, a, a moment, point of personal privilege. Um, when we were first talking about doing this recording, um, you had mentioned um, that the people you're in contact with had said that you should do my show. And I yes. was wondering why that was. Uh, good question. Overseer is current overseer. Is there a reason for this? No. <laughs> Fair enough. A booking is a booking. We'll take it. <laughs> yeah, that's very funny. That's really funny. Um, right, right. Uh, can I explain how they can tell? Hold on. Yes, I may. So you may notice that when I communicate, so I can communicate it by speaking or communicate it by thought. Uh, she can read either way. It's a bit invasive. I think my overseer agrees that it's a bit invasive that they can read all my thoughts. Um, but uh, when she responds to me, when my eyes flick downward, then that is her responding yes. And if my eyes flick over more like slightly down or to the right or, you know, to my right, that is her saying no. And if they flick like in like a diagonal right downward direction, that is her demurring. Like, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. Demurring, uh, like not answering a question, but answering with like a non-answer. So right. when she said, you might notice, I guess if we review the video that when I said, is there a reason why she said yes to this? Like my eyes would have flicked like that way. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, you physically looked in that direction, so yes, that's mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. A booking is a booking. So I'm just, you know, I was just merely curious because sometimes that is a good question, yeah, yeah. You know, some, some, sometimes there's a a specific reason. Sometimes there's not, and in this case, there's not, and that's okay. Um, well, so I think I that guess... she would have told. I think she would have told me not to do it if she got the sense that it would be bad. Um, the uh, so there is an ability to see into the future in a limited way. Like, um, is this, is my right that, uh, it's sort of like predictive in a sense. Um, hold on, I'm getting an answer for that. Yes, it is predictive. So it's kind of like, um, given all the, given the way the world is set up now, we can ask a, a question about a future event and find out like, will we be happy with that decision? You know, what will have happened? And it's not that these things are completely unchangeable, but it's that based on what we know now, if nothing changes, then how will the events of the world come together that, you know, we can find out like, I guess, are we gonna be happy with the fact that we did this podcast interview? I think the answer is probably yes. Um, and I'm guessing that there may not be any reason beyond that, but that, my overseer probably looked into the future and asked, are we going to be happy with the fact that we did this? And the answer was uh, yes. Um, but I want to uh, emphasize again that um, these things aren't completely unchangeable. You can make decisions that will alter the course of history, and it is much easier to predict major events than it is minor events, because um, the major events are things that would have happened anyway and are kind of harder to knock off course I guess, except for like extreme, like chaotic, you know, things like, I guess if someone makes a really extreme decision, like push the button now, nuclear war right now, that could be something that could have a major consequence for, you know, and be very big. But other than that, like the smaller the decision is, um, the harder it is to predict. Overseer, do I have that right? Yes. 
Very, very interesting. That reminds me of, um, as a student of, of tarot, we talk about this is the way things, what we see with the cards is the way things that they are. If, you know, un, if you don't make any other decisions that contradicted, this is, you know, as of this moment, this is how these things may play out because there's so many variables and possibilities of it all. So yeah, that, um, yeah, that, that makes sense. Is there any reason why these folks have picked now to really reach out? Have they been in touch with others in the past? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yes, they have been in touch with others in the past. There were um, over a thousand candidates, is my understanding, for the job that I got. But um, I think that they chose me for a bunch of reasons, and there were also many things that nearly disqualified me from, from getting this job. But the things that they liked... Um, <clears throat> included the uh, fact that I approached them with this science project. I think that they went seeking candidates for this kind of role um, and, pardon me, went looking for them. Um, and I guess none of them fit the bill. Um, but again, I'm just like a regular guy. I'm an extremely flawed person. <laughs> like, I'm human. Um, and uh, I think one thing that they another thing that they liked was that, well, one thing they liked was that, you know, uh, Star Wars, like midichlorians, the idea, which some people think ruined Star Wars. Are you familiar <laughs> with the midichlorians idea? I am. Yes, yes, yes. Apparently if not that it's real, it's not, but, um, my power level is high for a human and it may have been, um, one reason why it might be high is that I have so much of a history doing things that happen to be relevant for the kind of work that we're doing. Like I have been very interested in ways of using mental imagery to uh, superimpose it on your eyesight to, uh, for use in brain computer interfaces. And this has been like a real hobby of mine, my interest in this. And it turns out that this stuff is very good for reality editing, which is one of the central methods that you have of making changes of the kind that you need to uh, navigate their world um, like proficiently. Uh, and I think another thing that, that they liked about me, like why they, why I got hired for this was that, um, so I have a history of, uh, behavior where like, I, let's say I have a low self-esteem, but like I get a whiff of feeling like I'm special, I'm important. And then I get a really big head about it and I become like a horrible asshole. And then I realized like with regret, like, oh my God, you know, I have a problem, like, you know, stop being that way. And I have a history of doing this to a point where I have reached like a firm, like a, a decision that I, well, not a decision, like I, an understanding that I am not special, nor do I want to be special, that um, I'm just a regular, you know, I'm just a person among all the people and that nonetheless, we can try to do things that are really good for our society. And an impression I get is that um, it's a frequent problem that uh, like when you're trying to figure out who should be the first human to bring resurrections to our modern human society, that if such a person is seen as special, you know, um, that it can really go to their head quite easily. And I think that my experience with like having failed in this regard has prepared me for, for, um, trying to prevent that from happening uh, once more. So I think like my manifold flaws have perhaps made it so that I am suitable for this role. But in any case, I, I, well, that, I got the very, job. That's very, re that's very reminiscent of um, the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Elijah, um, Enoch, who went to heaven on a column of fire. He simply was not, he never died. He just sort of left. Um, so um, I think all the major prophets um, struggled in those areas as well. Um, you know, Moses chiefly among them. Um, really? His like, ego, his own really? ego prevented him from ever seeing the land of Israel, actually. Um, so um, after marching around in the desert for 80, 80 years and and having a, a crisis of faith, he was he got the children of Israel to the land of Canaan, but never crossed the River Jordan. He never made it himself because that was his punishment for kind of getting ahead of himself. Um, so um, your experiences and the way you talk about that kind of lines up with great prophets in the Bible. So it's no surprise to me. Ah, oh, I asked my about the Moses thing. I asked my overseer, "Is this true?" And she replied, "Yes." 
Uh, by the way, I, I should just paid attention in church growing up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, by the way, I just can. Can I tell them this? Yes, I may. So my overseer and my other colleagues have a habit of lying to me about certain things. Now, I don't know that they've lied about anything, especially when it seems like there's a pause when they're thinking about how to respond. Um, I don't know that they've lied about a single thing, but they have, they, it's, it seems, it, overseer, am I right that this is like, this is, they're trying to whip me into shape. They're trying to sand off the rough edges from me and prepare me for being like a good public servant. And I think some of it also might be punishment for like not being, you know, for, for, for my flaws. Um, like I don't deserve to have an easy time of it. Is that right? Yes, that is right. Of course, maybe she's lying, but uh, she's probably telling the truth. I, I'm pretty sure that that's the case. Um, but yes, hey, that's very interesting what you've just told me. Yeah, it's just, it just occurred to me in the course of the conversation. That's what I do. I have these strange conversations with people, and that's the, and then we record it, and that's the show. Um, so, um, so, uh, so when it comes to, uh, when it comes to all of all of this, I guess, um, what has it what has it meant for 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 you in terms of you've had all these experiences and you've got this new sort of experience? Um, I guess how you know has it what has it done for you? at a at a very you know at a very personal level what kind of people has it attracted in into your life because you know with uh in in years past with people like madame blavatsky or things like this usually you get you know sort of camp followers around and all this type of thing and i was i was wondering if you'd had a similar experience where it you know just kind of brought all sorts of new strange people into your life um it has brought people who i care about a lot into my life um I mean, I absolutely love my colleagues and friends who I have met from the other reality. They are so valued. And uh, yes. Um, and also, I started a Discord server. You know, I've been talking to a lot of people who care about a, a lot about this, and I really hope that they will that we'll have colleagues, you know, more people joining up uh, professionally to work on this stuff uh, with me, like alongside me, to be my peers, um, I at least. Uh, and um, yeah, people can get involved. Um, and I, I would absolutely love for more people. If you're anyone who's interested in actually getting professionally involved, the overseer, am I right that like if someone is interested in getting professionally involved in this, we can at least um, find out information about them and like submit an application for them, like have them submit an application. Is that true? Yes, that is true. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yes. So I'm very glad for the people who I've met from this other reality. I'm very glad for the people who I've met who are humans, who are interested in this, um, really love these new friendships that we're building. Um, the thing that matters more to me though, is the outcome. Like I, you know how there are, it's like this truism online, people saying that, you know, the thing that matters isn't the uh, destination, it's the journey. I think that's complete horseshit. And I always have. I think that is something I that is I agree with you. <laughs> yes! Yes! Uh, like, it's, that is something I, I've, I've never been on that train myself. I, I'm kind of like, no, I want to get to where I'm going and, you know, and achieve that and then get ready for the next thing but you know to uh, really achieve something and arrive to where you wanted to go i think is very special that hasn't happened very often in my life but i think it's special when it does well there's so. still time hey you want to do dmt <laughs> uh, for 10 years so it's uh, okay but again it, is, it has never it has never found me i've always missed it and so when it's time to come into my life it will arrive well, congratulations. We're, we're going to talk. But um, anyway, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so new people. Um, also, there are people opposing us. Previously, I referred to them as malevolent entities, but I found that that is offensive. And um, I believe that it really is offensive. It's like, uh, so Nazis um, dehumanized people. That was part of how they, you know, that was part of 
what they did that was so terrible and I think allowed them and their people, their forces to uh, commit the atrocities that they did. Um, you know, it allowed them to have themselves do that to other people. And um, so dehumanizing isn't good. And I mean, obviously it's, it's, it's not good. And so these malevolent entities, you know, Nazis were people too, right? Like, even if they're awful and did terrible things, they are people. And so these, these people opposing us, which is the term that I've been using now, like people who've been trying to kill me, they are people, even if they're not human beings, even if they are these other kind, these other species that I've been encountering that are from the other reality who are trying to kill me, I've been referring to them as people opposing us uh, recently, ever since I found out that like malevolent entities, imagine if we were referred to as entities I think that we'd find that pretty othering. And so no more talk about entities. Uh, there are people who are trying to kill me, that kind of thing. And um, some of them turn out to be really wonderful. Even if they are trying to kill me, they have great senses of humor, they're intelligent, and some of them can be persuaded. And so I've been working on that. And like, <laughs> um, it's, it's been really great. Unfortunately, like the, the chocolates that I've purchased for them and like the meals that I've prepared, I think that pretty much everyone from the other reality universally hates the food that I've prepared for them. But, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to make inroads with the uh, people opposing us and get more of them on our side. They probably have a bunch of good intelligence, you know, like information for us as well. Well, perhaps we need to open a Nobu in the heavenly realms and that <laughs> bring them around. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, I what they're missing is Wolfgang Puck. I we, during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, I always used to joke. I said, "Couldn't we bring these people around with an airdrop of some Playboys and some whiskey?" Like, you know, I think that could improve their lives. Perhaps the people who are opposing you are similarly affected. A good meal and a nice glass of wine, and you'd be surprised how they might come around. Well, um, you know, one thing they they watch a lot of our TV shows and movies. Like that's a bunch a of them bag. I mean, that can be good and bad. <laughs> uh, yes, but like a bunch of them had seen Game of Thrones, and oh, I, I didn't see, ask that's them what they so thought. Good. <laughs> I know I didn't ask them what they thought of the later seasons, but um, they like they when we were figuring out movies to watch, they wanted to watch Die Hard and they wanted to watch Rush Hour, and like Harold, who is a dead human who's been advising me and and overseeing me. Um, hey, uh, overseer is Harold technically an overseer? Yes, that is information that I didn't know. So Harold is I, I, one of the people who's been overseeing me. And um, Harold did not want to watch Rush Hour 3. I think that Harold thought that it was bad or something. But the, the uh, people opposing us did, so we ended up watching it. What fun. Well, I'll be very interested to see um, what, what happens when uh, this comes out and they watch it and we'll find out what happens oh, in your uh, life. <laughs> yes. So mm -hmm. that'll be very entertaining. Um, so why don't you describe to us um, for the uninitiated, <laughs> um, who, if you're still listening at this point, bravo, um, what DMT is, where it comes from? Is it synthetic? Is it plant derived? What What is it? Oh. Uh, DMT, um, that's funny, actually. Okay, so. I use DMT vapes. I use NNDMT, which is chemically made. I'm not exactly sure how it's made. In fact, I'm not really sure at all, except that I know that it is uh, created. Uh, we have DMT naturally occurring in our brains, and I believe that DMT facilitates the transition into life and out of life, which is the reason why when you have, uh, like when you're dying or when your body thinks that you're dying, like there are near-death experiences where people briefly glimpse you know, visions of, uh, like, going to another place and then coming back. Um, DMT seems to be, yes, a means of transitioning from, like, your soul, I guess, uh, into our existence. So I'm not exactly sure when is the soul created. That's a good question. But um, also out of this existence into an afterlife or into, like, I guess, sort of stasis or something for, uh, you know, later... Uh, use um so this project that we have to do resurrections it's not like we're going to resurrect a few people i think the idea is that like in the bible um it's discussed that there will be a time when like the dead walk among us and so i think the idea is that eventually as things get more and more advanced we're going well, to try to the resurrect in epistles the dead when revelation the dead shall rise first as part of the rapture it's a whole thing oh okay um 
Yes. And so we're going to resurrect, I think, pretty much every good hearted person that there has ever been eventually will be resurrected. Uh, overseer, am I right about that? Yes. My overseer says that I'm right about that. And um, I've also been told that we're going to be kind of like the elves in the Lord of the Rings. Like, we're going to get to look young for a, indefinitely. And, um, well, and there will be an interesting group of new guests to have on the show. Perhaps I should try <laughs> interviewing Abraham Lincoln or something. Uh, I um, was going to bring up Abraham Lincoln because I said to Harold at one point, I said, I wonder what Abraham Lincoln's going to think of this. And he said, yes. Like, as in he agreed with me, I wonder what Abraham Lincoln's going to think of this. Now, it's interesting. So when people die, when humans die, um, some of them go to an afterlife where they're living, let's say, in or around Abrahamic heaven. Uh, but many of them, it seems, do not. And that really, that uh, when they're resurrected, essentially they will have died, and then very next moment they're going to be waking up in 2024 or 5 or 6 or 8 or, you know, whenever they're resurrected, that's their next experience of life. So for them, you know, we can, I think that we might imagine here in 2024 that um, if this kind of thing were to happen, that it would be in a distant future, but a distant future like 200 years from now, you know, like Star Trek, sort of like, you know, it, it seems like the future for us is like 200 or 300 years from now. But I think that for someone like Abraham Lincoln, he's going to wake up and be like, what the fuck are cell phones? This you know? will be Star Trek. No, this will be Star Trek. I mean, imagine exactly. you're shot in the back of the head at Ford's Theater. You die at the house next door in 1865. And you're, and then he was, this is, this is for him, science fiction, you know? Exactly. I mean, and I mean, for, for him, I mean, even the reality of this conversation to be like, yes, I'm in Wilmington, Delaware, speaking to someone on the West Coast, live it's being recorded and will be replayable i mean that for someone of that period would be so fantastic when photography had just been invented you know sort yeah. of thing you know it's like it's like you know pictures well now they move and we transport them over wires and through the air you know sort of thing yeah when were telegraphs invented were there telegraphs at the time Telegraphs had just come in in the in the 1860s, late 1850s yeah. or 1860s. Yeah, the first transatlantic telegraph wire is laid in 1867, I believe. So uh -huh. yeah, I mean, the, such a, su such forms of instant communication had just began. Right, the, and it's kind of like we have spaceships, like we have, you know, we can send a rocket to the moon, but the idea that like you'd be able to, tra you know, go like warp nine or whatever. Seems like yeah. just distant science. And so it'll be kind of like that for someone like Abraham Lincoln. Right. Yes, but yeah, yeah, yes. There was there was an episode of Star Trek with that very premise, actually. Um oh. people got cryo frozen in the past and they were woke up in the 24th century and everything had changed, sort of thing. It was like in season three. Um I'm a huge Star Trek nerd. That's why I, only reason I bring it up. Um Okay, I, guess I I was aware about the about DMT existing in our brains. Um, I'm autistic, and in the autism community, one of the theories we have about one of the many things that are wrong with our brains is that we actually have too much of it. We produce too much of it naturally. Really, and that is part of the issue. It's a it's only a theory, nothing proven, nothing scientifically really tested yet or anything. But there's a theory that goes around the community that our brains produce too much DMT and that's part of the problem with autism. Uh, that that's interesting. what you will. I'm gonna write it down. Uh uh Too much. Okay. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's yeah, it's a kind of a very interesting, interesting thing, which is one of the reasons why I had always kind of wondered about, uh, wondered about it and all this type of thing. It was like it was one of the few, few things that I'd never, I'd never done. But um, it's uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, so when it comes to, I guess all these different realities and this bright burgeoning future um <laughs> i guess the i guess the question kind of begs given what's going on in the world with 
pandemics and wars and all this type of thing, um, what what must the other side think of our tawdry human affairs? Oh, well, I think they get a lot of their culture. Like they, uh, the analogy that I've used is like this: it's it's like dolphins and humans. Um, that we are aware that dolphins have societies, or I mean, do they that they're intelligent and that they have something like they have complex social interactions and that they seem to be really cool. We like dolphins, but uh, we don't really they see any reason to get humans when one of their member is in trouble. They're very good at that. To say that again. Dolphins are very good at finding humans when one of their pod is in trouble. Uh, sure. Uh, I wasn't aware of that, but yeah, that, that makes no, sense. No, no, to no. Me. There's several cases where like a dolphin will be caught in a fishnet and one of his friends will go find a diver nearby and get the diver to come free their friend sort of thing. Right, they so know, there's... We need P someone with opposable thumbs. And so right. They go find the like, come over here, my friend is stuck sort of thing, and then they free him and they're very happy. Um, in the 18th century, even be it 16th and 17th century, um, sailors thought dolphins were a good omen for a voyage. I mean, there's we kind of have this relationship with that species over over centuries, so... Yes, that makes sense, and... Yeah, at the same time, we're not offering dolphins like, "Hey, dolphins, do you want to get online? Like, would you like to join Facebook? Do you want to have act? You want to have two day Prime shipping? We're not really doing that, right? But at the, yes. it would be handy for dolphins if they had drones flying over the ocean and dropping packages into the water. Don't we think? Wouldn't they enjoy that? I mean, I I would hope so. I've always thought the same thing of elephants. I, I had sure. A, I had a, a my my art mentor Jesse Jacobs. Um, she was very passionate about animals. And uh, I told her, I said, you know, elephants are so unbelievably intelligent. They mourn their dead. They even, you know, will use basic tools, all this type of thing. I said, one day, I think at the UN, there should be a human representative for the elephant collective sort of thing. Like they should have internet, I have a degree in international relations. So I think in that sort of thing, like they should have a vote at the UN because they are clearly a society. They just don't speak words like we do, but they very clearly are a people that right. And we, we know a lot about their them. deaths, have politics. Like they really, there should be an elephant nation, and they should have a representative at the UN that speaks human sort of thing. You know, I basically I think that I understand, and I basically agree with that. Um, so we know a lot about dolphins, we know a lot about elephants, and they know some limited things about us, but they don't know everything about us. We know more about them than they do about us. Would you agree with that? Yes, of course. Okay, so now follow along with this. Um, if, let's say, a dolphin or an elephant were to come up to us and have, and have a way of communicating, hey, we've heard about this internet thing and we want to be hooked up, don't right. we think that in that case we would find a way to hook them up? I think there are some people somewhere who would attempt it, yes. Right. So basically, I'm like, we are the dolphins and these other people in this other reality are the humans. I have gone to them and I said, okay, enough with this shit, you know, like, let's get down to business. Will you please do a science project with us and help us prove this stuff to our scientific establishment and help us improve our world? And they said yes. So it's like we have made the request. Please help us join as full peers of you. Help us be elevated to, yes, to being, like, let us be a society together. They already know a lot about us. They watch Game of Thrones, right. you know? But now, we're, they, I mean, they have television as well. I, they showed me some clips of their TV shows. It's really cool. And wouldn't we like to have them in our society as well? Uh, Overseer, do I have this approximately right? Yes, I do. Well, I, if they want to have some fun, I would invite them to watch this show. It's on YouTube and all streaming, but <laughs> all oh, audio um, well, streaming uh, platforms. I, I'm, um, I think my colleagues are. If they're not watching this at this moment, then they will see it for sure. <laughs> um, yes, no, that I mean, no, I mean, I think that metaphor between animals and humans and humans is quite is quite apt, and that it reminds me very much of David Spangler's work with uh, a people he calls the she, which are kind of fairies but more human not fairies in the way that we conceive of them but more as people who exist in the in liminal realms beyond our ordinary perception sure. um and the the co-creative work they would like to do with humanity um 
in terms of uh, improving the planet and changing, you know, how how we exist in this part of the world and all this type of thing. Um, so, um, yeah, so that that definitely, you know, kind of makes sense with other other things bumping around in the in the space and whatnot. So, well, this has been, <laughs> I think, probably one of the strangest. 45 minute interviews I have ever done in 10 years of broadcasting, almost 20 years in media and 10 years of this show specifically. Um, final thoughts? Uh, well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this interview. And, you know, uh, I think I'd say stay tuned. Like we're barreling toward the first successful resurrection and all the many consequences, positive consequences, almost all of them that will come from this. I think what I'd say is help is on the way and that the society on the other side is just wonderful. They are so nice and, and we're going to get to see a lot more of them soon. Fantastic. Well, um, perhaps, uh, would you like people to follow you on Twitter? Perhaps mention your handle. Oh, sure. Uh, ben Landis, B E N L A N D I S. Excellent. Wonderful. And oh, also thing, wait, yes. uh, join the discord as well. Um, I have a DMT experiences journal uh, that you can read at dmt.benlandis.com. And at the top of that, there's a link to join the Discord server that I started, the uh, um, uh, the reality research community, I think it's called. Uh, no, the Re reality research collective, sorry. Um, yes, please join the Discord and get involved. And if you're interested in professionally working with the administration of heaven, uh, that is a possibility. So please do get involved. And um, I really look forward to uh, talking to people, working with people. And uh, let's all look forward to resurrections and the, the good things that will be coming into our lives very soon. Well, thank you so much for coming on the Cameron Journal podcast. Thank you for having me. That's all for this episode of the Cameron Journal podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Visit us online at CameronJournal.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I love to talk to my followers and listeners. So please feel free to uh, get us on social media at Cameron Cowan on Twitter. And we'll see you next time on the Cameron Journal podcast. Thank you.